portugués. Uh, so the presentation is going to be in English. It's preferable English than Spanish, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> um, my name is Fernando Gold. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and the locals for uh, allowing me to be present at this conference. I have been having a good time for a few days already. Um, this presentation is about recent, recent advances in IPv6 security. I will um, start with a brief presentation about myself. I work for my own company, C6 Networks, and during the last few years I have been working for a couple of organizations in the UK on a number of projects about um, communication protocol security. The last one being about IPv6 security. Uh, as part of that project, uh, one of the things that we did was to perform a, a thorough um, security assessment of the IPv6 uh, specifications and also we analyzed um, real IPv6 implementations to see uh, whether there were issues that were present in the implementations but not on the specifications themselves. Um, part of the work that we did, uh, we, we took it to the IETF, which is the standard for organization for internet protocols. So uh, <coughs> most, if not all, of this presentation will be about those advances that we have produced as a result of this project. Uh, you have the URL for my personal website where you can find publications, uh, slideware, and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is the agenda of the presentation. These are the topics that we will be discussing. First of all, the disclaimer. I will go to the disclaimer later. Uh, and essentially, we will we'll go through advances in IPv6 addressing, fragmentation and reassembly, first hop security, firewalling, and some denial of service attacks that are present in, in v6. Then we will try to drive a few conclusions and then we will jump to the questions section and hopefully answers. Some disclaimer or a few disclaimers about this presentation. First of all, it assumes that you know the basics about uh, IPv4 security. It also assumes that you know the basics about IPv6 security. And the reason for this is that typically when you see an IPv6, uh, an IPv6 security presentation, the presenter usually needs to go through a lot of introductory material so he wasted like half of 50% of the time on introductory stuff. I have tried to avoid that. There are a couple of introductory slides, but for the most part, uh, those are skipped. Another thing is that much of the work that I will be discussing is work in progress. So if you have feedback on the stuff that I will be discussing, are you interested in that? And the last one, which is um, I realize that it's one thing that usually frustrates people at security conferences. It's like everyone is waiting for a zero day to be released. Well, that's not the case with this presentation, so you can be frustrated right now because that's not going to happen in the presentation. Uh, yeah, sad part being that um, uh, I did like a similar presentation not that long ago, and uh, a friend of mine that was in the audience uh, after the, the conference told me, well, you know, there was a guy that waited or, or saw your entire presentation, then he went outside like frustrated because you didn't release any zero day. So that's why I'm saying that this is not going to happen. So you may leave now if that's what you were expecting. Uh, other than that, uh, it's usually the case with protocol stuff that there, there are not that many zero day stuff in the sense that usually it's like more of uh, denial of service attacks, but it's not that usual that you find like uh, stuff that from a logic point of view uh, can get you, let's say, root access or whatever to, to a system. So this is not going to happen in this presentation. Uh, so what is the motivation for this presentation? Uh, you may have heard about IPv6. I'm not going to do an IPv6 uh, introduction. The idea is essentially that uh, we are running out of IPv4 addresses. And the only thing that we have on the table to uh, address the problem is IPv6. Essentially, IPv6 does nothing more than providing more addresses. But since uh, the address, since the IPv4 address exhaustion problem is a real problem, uh, that's why IPv6 is important, and that's why we are talking about it. Um, IPv6 represents a number of challenges from many different points of view, from from an operational point of view, but also from a security point of view, and. Um, the question is here is what we can do about those, those challenges. And while the, probably this slide is going to sound like a, or is going to look like a little bit funny, I think that it really represents, uh, well, different behaviors in, in people that are involved with this technology. So first option uh, for security, uh, for what you can do about security problems is essentially ignoring them. 
So you will see that many organizations that are planning for V6 deployment, essentially they ignore any problems in V6 security, so they do nothing. And uh, that's option one, which many people are following. Of course, it's not the recommended one. There's option two, that sometimes is a consequence of option one, sometimes you go directly to that one, that uh, you find out that there were security problems with V6, but sometimes you realize about that too late. And option three, which is the one that we are trying to do, is to, pre to prevent people from suiciding, or not too quick at least, and uh, try to discuss some things that can be done about V6 security. Uh, for the most part, I would say that uh, usually most of the presentations that you see about IPv6 security are about problems, and uh, I would say that that's usually the case in many uh, different areas in security. It's like people are usually more interested in finding bugs and exploits, uh, maybe it pays better, but usually there are not that many people actually trying to fix stuff. So uh, this presentation is mostly about that. We will be discussing problems, but the idea is not really to point out where the problems are, but actually uh, to try to discuss what we can do about it. So, um, okay, as I said before, uh, the slides that will follow are essentially the results of a project that lasts for a little bit more than two years. Uh, the idea was always during the project to analyze the specifications, also take a look at actual implementations, try to come up with possible ways in which the protocols could be exploited. Uh, we also uh, developed a set of tools that for some reason they became public not that long ago. I don't know if that was intended or not, but they are online. Uh, I will provide a link to that one later, to the set of tools. and. Um, then uh, we took the, the results of that project to the IETF because in many cases uh, the, 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 the solution to many of the problems that we will be discussing had to do with fixing the protocol implementations. Or sometimes it's not that the protocol implement, uh, specifications are, are broken, but uh, maybe that they, are, uh, they need to be tightened up a little bit. Uh, so that's, that's what this presentation is about, ongoing work on, on V6 security. So, first topic is about advances in IPv6 addressing. This is probably the, the only introductory slide, or one of the two or three introductory slides in all the presentation. As I said before, um, the increased address space in v6 is the only driver for uh, deploying IPv6. Uh, you may have heard lots of things and myths about IPv6 from improved quality of service, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, from my perspective, all of those are marketing claims, but as I said before, this is not an introductory talk on V6, so that's why I'm not going to discuss them. So V6 employs 128-bit addresses. Essentially, bottom line is that they are the same as um, IPv4 addresses. For example, you aggregate addresses into prefixes for routing purposes. Uh, you have different address types in the sense of um, unicast, multicast addresses, and so on. You also have different address codes. So for example, you may have link local addresses, the same thing that you have in before, you may have global addresses and so on. That's, there's no difference in that respect to IPv4. And probably the only difference that you have with uh, V4 addressing is that typically on, uh, on an IPv6 uh, host, you are usually using more than one address at the same time. So for example, if you take any IPv4 host, usually you are just using a global address or a private address, but that's it. Uh, whereas in the case of IPv6, it's very usual to have at least a couple or three addresses for each network interface. But that's probably the only difference that you have between the two. So this is the format or the syntax for uh, global unicast addresses. Of course, there are many different types and uh, scopes. As I said, you have multicast, unicast, and so on addresses. You have different scopes, global, link local, and so on. But um, for what comes in the next few slides, we are only concerned about the syntax of global unicast addresses, which means public addresses, if you want, the ones that you will use to connect to the public internet. Essentially, uh, you have a global routing prefix that is assigned by your upstream, same thing as with before. Then you have a few bits for the subnet ID, and then you have typically 64 bits here, which are called the interface ID, which is what you probably know uh, as the host ID in the IPv4 world. Uh, these first two uh, fields, 
are the same or the, the, the use is the same as in IPv4. Uh, the only difference, if anything, is the interface ID. And since in IPv6, of course, uh, the interface ID is much larger than in the IPv4 case, you have many different ways to select this field here. Of course, in IPv4, uh, since you typically use just 8 bits for that, there are not that many choices as to what you can do with that field. But with IPv6, since the field is much, uh, much larger, there are different possible ways in which you can select that field. Among them, uh, one of them is to select the interface ID, uh, essentially embedding the MAC address in the interface ID. It's also possible to randomize the interface ID, that's usually called privacy addresses. It's also possible to manually configure the interface ID, which means that you set the interface ID to all zeros and you just vary the last byte. And there are also some transition and coexistence technologies such as 6 to 4, delete and so on, which specify the way in which you should select those addresses. For the most part, we'll be discussing just these first few categories. So, um, one of the first implications that we will discuss about V6 addressing is the implications on host scanning. And this is one of the myths that you usually hear about uh, or related with, um, with B6 addressing. Uh, and it's essentially a claim that um, host scanning attacks are impossible in IPv6. And usually, well, the numbers, this is actually a quote that uh, I didn't make this one up. I just searched it on Google, and this was one of the first ones that came up. The numbers vary from this one to even more ridiculous ones. Uh, but essentially, the, the numbers that these people come up with are numbers such as, uh, what's that, like uh, 500,000 million, whatever, years. A lot of years. Uh, the point is that, um, well, these people assume that since the other space is so large, if you wanted to try like every possible address for a host scanning attacks in the same way that you do for before, uh, it would take ages, so it's not, it's not really possible to, to do that. So the question here there you go, um, is whether, I mean, the idea what we try to prove, uh, whether it's, it's correct or not, whether that number uh, it has anything to do with, with reality. So usually these people assume that uh, if you want to do a, an IPv6 host scanning attack, you essentially have to search on the entire uh, interface ID space. So if I go back a few slides, the idea is that they assume that since you have 60, 64 bits here, you have to try every single address in that space. So that's like this, uh, whoops. So that's like 2 to 64. And uh, well, with the, with common bandwidth that we have nowadays, uh, that will take probably that amount of years. So the idea is to try to analyze how IPv6 services are selected in practice. So when I was studying this stuff, I came out with this paper by David Malone, and essentially what this guy did, he um, tried to measure uh, how IPv6 services are selected or created in the real world. Uh, he essentially measured that for hosts, but also for routers. For, the, for measuring how addresses are selected for, for hosts, what he did, if I recall correctly, was to set up a, a web server uh, and he just logged all the IPv6 addresses of the clients that were connecting to that web server. And I think that for measuring uh, the addresses of uh, routers, essentially he did the trace route to many different sites so that he would get the, the, um, the IPv6 addresses or, of routers on the path. These are the results that he got. Um, for example, you can see that 50% of the addresses are Slack. Slack means that you have the MAC address embedded in the interface ID. So that's 50% of the addresses. Then you have 20% of the addresses that embed an IPv4 address. So we will see that in essentially what you do in that case in the interface ID, in the interface ID you, um, you include the IPv4 address of the same interface. I will provide some examples later. And uh, well, you have a 10% of Tirido address, uh, addresses. Tirido is uh, a transition technology produced by Microsoft. You also have uh, an 8% of low byte addresses. Low byte addresses are the ones that in which you, you set the interface ID to all zeros and you just vary the last byte. Typically, these addresses are the result of manual configuration because well, humans are supposed to just set it to zeros and just vary the last byte because they are easy to, to remember. 6% of privacy addresses, which essentially means that the interface ID was randomized, and the rest of the, of the numbers are marginal. In the case of routers, the numbers change quite a little bit. 
uh, you can see that 70% of the address is a low byte, which means that the interface ID is set to all zeros and only the last byte varies. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense because if you are configuring the, the interface of a router, typically you do it manually, and uh, in order for the addresses to be more easy to, uh, or easier to, to remember, you, set, you just change the last byte. There's a 5% of IPv4 base addresses, which means that you put the IPv4 address in the interface ID. That also makes sense because if, for example, you recall, you remember the, um, the IPv4 address of some interface of a router, then it's trivial to come up with the IPv6 address if you encode the addresses this way. And the rest of the numbers are, are marginal. Uh, as a side note about these results, uh, the paper was published in 2008, which means that probably the guy did all the analysis in 2007. A lot of things have changed since, since then, so probably these results are obsolete for many reasons. We can discuss that later. But uh, from my perspective, what's more important about this slide is that uh, you can clearly see that the addresses are not random, but that they actually follow specific patterns. Okay? So it's not that they are just random numbers, but for example, you have 50% that follow this specific pattern. Okay. So uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned that, uh, for example, in the case of host, you had a 50% of the addresses that uh, were embedding the MAC address of, of the host. So this is the format of just the interface ID, which means the low order 64 bits of the address. Okay, I removed the global routing prefix and the subnet ID. So if you take a look at this, essentially what you do is you split the MAC address into two pieces. You include the upper 24 bits on here, the lower 24 bits here, and you simply uh, insert those, those two bytes in the middle. And uh, if you actually think about it, of all these 64 bits that were supposed to be unpredictable, well, only 24 bits are actually, if anything, unpredictable. Because typically the uh, IEEE OOI is a number that you can look it up from the IEEE website, which essentially means that, for example, if you wanted to scan a network and you know that, for example, that network is full of whatever, Cisco routers, for example, uh, then of course you know what are the IEEE uh, OUIs for Cisco interfaces. So if anything, these 24 bits here uh, could be reduced to just 2, 3, 4, maybe at most 10 different numbers, but it's not too elevated to 24, okay? Of course, these two bytes are fixed. They are always the same for this type of addresses. And then the, the bits that are supposed to be random are the low order uh, 24 bits. But, um, well, first of all, what we could say, even if we, we assume that these low order 24 bits were random, if you think about it, scanning uh, an address space of 24 bits is already feasible. So we, we uh, we started assuming that we had to go through a, a search space of 64 bits, and now we are saying that we only, if we know a little bit about the network, for example, what, what's the manufacturer of the devices that are connected to that network, then the search space may be a few uh, 24 bits, okay? Now, if you look at the structure of uh, those uh, 24 bits, uh, these bits uh, are not really random, because they are typically used as serial numbers, but they were interface card manufacturers, which means that, for example, if there's whatever, real tape that is producing NICs, so one of the NICs is going to have the number one, all zeros here, and then one, the second one is going to have the number two, and so on. So it's not that they uh, randomize that number when they are producing the network interface cards. So that means, for example, that, um, let's say, if you know that some company bought, about, a, let's say, 400 systems from the, same, from the same vendor at the same time, then it's very likely that the MAC addresses will be, will be um, sequential, okay? So if you find one, you know that the next ones are going to be sequential from that one. It's also usually the case that um, MAC addresses are geographically clustered. Which means that, for example, let's say that there is, um, how do you say, like a partner of whatever vendor that uh, buys a lot of devices from some vendor, Cisco or whatever that is. Uh, they typically buy a bunch of them and they sell those devices in the same geographical region, okay? So that also means that, for example, if uh, you knew MAC addresses that were in use at some company that has bought devices recently, 
then that might be used or might be leveraged to scan some other company that you know both devices from the same vendor at roughly the same time. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, well, even if we had to go through the uh, entire uh, 24 bits space, the other scans would be feasible, but um, it would be possible, uh, it should be possible to actually narrow down the search space even more than that. We are actually trying to come up with some numbers. We are uh, currently measuring the, how the MAC addresses are distributed, but we were not able to produce the results yet. Um, there's uh, an, another interesting case is what happens with uh, virtualization technologies. For example, if you use VirtualBox, uh, <coughs> and you take a look at the MAC addresses that they employ for virtual interfaces, they use specific uh, IEEE OUIs. So for example, in the case of VirtualBox, they employ this one, which means that the um, upper 24 bits are always going to be these ones, okay? And the only ones that are going to be randomized, if anything, are the low order 24 bits. So that means that if, for example, uh, you wanted to scan an IPv6 network and you know that, or you are targeting, for example, virtual machines in that network, then you don't even need to actually try the different uh, OUIs, but you, you can just focus on the OUI that is used for, by VirtualBox. In the case of VMware, it's actually even more reduced. I don't really want to, uh, to go into details, but for example, for uh, MAC addresses that are automatically generated, they not only use a specific UI, but also for the uh, low order 24 bits, they select uh, 16 of those bits according to the IPv4 address of that node. So that means that the search space is even more reduced to that. Um, well, and this is for the case for the manually configured Macs, which means that if you are using VMware and you just don't want VMware to select the MAC addresses randomly, they, uh, they, you select the, the, the MAC addresses from a different OUI. And in this case, you're going to have a search space of 22 bits. The point or the, the, the bottom line with this discussion is that we, uh, we arrived to the discussion of IPv6 host scanning, assuming that we had to go through uh, a search space of 64 bits, and we're actually saying that in most cases you just have to go through uh, only 24 bits. Uh, I have mentioned before that um, it's also possible to um, write an IPv6 address encoding or embedding an IPv4 address. This is actually allowed by the IPv6 uh, specifications, and you can clearly see there that essentially what you have is um, is uh, uh, an IPv6 prefix, and in the low order bytes, you essentially write down the IPv4 address of, of the system, okay? Um, of course, if you are selecting your IPv6 addresses with this scheme, the search space is going to be the same as in IPv4. You don't really need to go through like random address or go through the 64 bits, but you just, for example, try, you just bury these last two bytes and you, the, the search space is, is greatly reduced. Uh, then, uh, another address type that I mentioned before uh, was um, low byte addresses. Low byte addresses essentially mean that you set the interface ID to all zeros and you just bury the last byte. So that, this would be an example of that. Essentially, you have the prefix here. This means that uh, you complete the IPv6 address with zeros just to come up with a 128-bit uh, number. And uh, so this is all zeros here. And then you have a, a one in the low order byte. Of course, the idea is that uh, if you need to select the address of a second system, you put the two here and so on. So you're just burying the last byte. Of course, for example, if, if you're selecting your addresses, just barring this byte, the search space is going to be just 8 bits. There are other cases, for example, in which they don't bury just the last byte, but the last couple of bytes. So in my, the search space could be uh, 16 bits. But again, bottom line is that it's not the 64 bits that we thought that we have to go through, but that the, the search space is greatly reduced. So. Um, some, um, of course, uh, there are some vendors that realize of uh, these uh, problems. Actually, the only one that came up with uh, a mitigation, if you want, uh, 
is uh, Microsoft, the, let's say the mitigation approach that they came up with doesn't mitigate every problem that we have with addressing, but of course it's better than nothing. What they did essentially is just randomize the, uh, the interface ID, but uh, let's say that when you, um, essentially what they do is they randomize the MAC address when you install the system. So after that, you are going to always use the same interface ID for any network that you are using. The benefit of that is, of course, that since they are randomizing the MAC address, I mean, not the MAC address that they use in Ethernet packets, but the MAC address that they use for producing the, the IPv6 addresses. Of course, the, the benefit of that is that, um, in that case, you cannot really assume, for example, that the IEEE um, OUI is going to be some specific value because they are randomizing that one. So from the point of view of uh, scanning attacks, uh, this is a good approach to mitigate that. But we will see later that uh, this scheme has uh, problems, still keeps problems with host tracking. That is something that we will discuss in the next few slides. Uh, some conclusions about IPv6 uh, scanning attacks. Well, conclusion is that they are feasible. Um, probably the only difference that we will find with v6 scanning attacks uh, with respect to v4 is that they are going to be less brute force than in IPv4. The re probably the reason for which we were we were able to get off with uh, brute force scanning attacks in IPv4 is that the scale of the problem was uh, small. So if a typical IPv4 network is, let's say, at most 256 possible addresses, then for such a small problem, you don't really need to put much intelligence in the way you, you prove cost. But when the problem of the, when the, when the search space increases, uh, then you probably need to put more intelligence in the way you perform the scanning attacks. Uh, it's possible to make the, uh, these scanning attacks uh, unfeasible. Uh, we will see later that we have a, um, a proposal which actually was adopted by the ITF already to actually do something or generate the addresses in, the, in a different way so that we mitigate this problem. So in, uh, it's possible to actually make the scanning attacks infeasible, but that's not the case nowadays because many, if not most, systems select the addresses this way. Um, also, another thing that I think that we will see soon is uh, different tools that, ex that explore other techniques for host scanning. For example, uh, it's uh, very possible to actually extract uh, addresses from the application layer protocols, from torrents to other applications, which I wouldn't say leak, because actually they, 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 in order for them to work as expected, they need to, let's say, to, in, to include or publish the, the addresses, the IP addresses of the host. So I wouldn't be surprised if not uh, in, the short, in the short term, uh, somebody came up with some tool that just goes to the internet, search for torrents, uh, for example, and just tries to extract the IPv6 addresses from the torrents rather than, for example, try a brute force scan of, of an entire network. There are lots of different techniques to, to, to be explored for host scanning attacks. As, um, as a comment about this, uh, if I recall correctly, there are not yet tools that implement these techniques. So, for example, even when uh, even when Nmap was released uh, in June, uh, the last version, and they included V6 support, they don't uh, implement any of the techniques that I discussed here. So they don't really try to, let's say, exploit or leverage address patterns. Uh, at least last time that I had checked, Nmap, for example, they uh, it doesn't allow you to specify a prefix to scan. So uh, it, it, you can port scan a single IPv6 address, but you cannot, for example, scan an address block. Uh, we are coming up with a tool about this. I know that there's other people that are producing tools in this area, so in the last few months, you, the, you, this kind of tool should be available. Uh, another area where IPv6 addressing has uh, implications is, is privacy. Uh, the essential idea is that if we assume that a host uh, generate their IPv6 addresses by embedding, uh, for example, the Ethernet address in the interface ID, let's assume, for example, that we have the same system connecting two different networks. So when it connects to this network, this is the prefix, okay, it includes some, let's assume that this is the, the, the MAC address, this number in the interface ID, and now if the same system connects to a different network, this other one, it essentially includes the same number in the interface ID because of course it has the same Ethernet address, okay? 
So the problem that uh, the problem with this technique or uh, yeah technique or policy to, to generate addresses is that as you move from one network to another, the prefix is changing, of course, you're moving from one network to another, but then the interface ID is the same on all networks. So the idea is that if, for example, I see this address and then at some other point in time I see this other address, I can tell that it's the same host that has been connected to different networks. Why? Because the interface ID here is the same, right? And since, uh, uh, for example, since Ethernet addresses are globally unique, you know that this number, if this, if some host is using this number, then it means that if you see this number again, it's the same host using it. At least, of course, the host is manually setting it or, or whatever. So the problem with um, uh, with the um, current policy for generating uh, addresses, for example, by including the, the, the MAC address, is that the interface ID essentially leaks out the identity of the node. It's a number that identifies uh, the node uh, in the global network, and you can think of that number as a, as a kind of cookie, okay? Uh, what are the, what are the ITF uh, realized of this problem, like, at least five years ago? And essentially what they came up with is RSC 4941, which is what's called usually what's usually called privacy or temporary addresses, and uh, let's say the short explanation about this RSC is that is that they select the uh, interface IDs randomly, but the problem is that they don't use RFC 4941 in replacement to the traditional addresses, but in addition to those addresses. So that means that you're still using the uh, Ethernet-based addresses, but in addition you also select these ones which means that you still have the, uh, the, the, the constant interface IDs uh, on the traditional addresses. The only system that I have seen that actually uses RSC 4941 uh, in replacement of traditional addresses is OpenBSD. All other systems, for example, Windows, uh, FreeBSD and others, they use uh, 4149 in addition to the traditional addresses. So uh, these temporary addresses mitigate the, the, the host tricking problem only partially. The idea is that when you, have, when you connect to, a, a, so to some public system, you use the temporary addresses rather than the traditional ones. But since those traditional addresses are still configured, it would be possible for an attacker to try to prove those addresses and see whether uh, it's the same system uh, that is connecting to the, to, the, to the same server, for example. So um, what follows is what we came up with to actually solve this problem. Um, essentially, uh, when we were thinking about this problem, we tried to analyze what type of addresses we have. And uh, we essentially took into account two different categories. First of all, whether the interface ID is predictable or unpredictable. And then whether the interface ID is stable or is temporary. So for example, when it comes to uh, RFC 4941, those addresses are uh, temporary and unpredictable. Unpredictable, of course, because the interface ID is randomized, but they are temporary because uh, those addresses change over time. So every few minutes, you have to select another random interface identifier. There are also the uh, Ethernet-based addresses, which are stable because, of course, once you configure one of those addresses, you use the same address all the time, so they are stable. But at the same time, they are predictable, OK? Again, because they have a specific pattern that they follow. So the idea is that we were lacking of some kind of address that was stable, but wasn't predictable. The reason for that is that, for example, we want uh, that um, every system that connects to our network gets an address that is not predictable, but we don't want our system to be changing the, its address all the time, because that makes it harder uh, network management from an operational point of view. Um, so this is the scheme that we came up with. Uh, this should be IETF. This one was uh, already accepted by the, the IETF um, a few months a few months ago. And the basic idea is to uh, select the uh, interface ID as a result of a hash function that you compute over these parameters. Uh, first one is the prefix, the network prefix. Of course, we. In well, bottom line, the, the security of this uh, mechanism relies on the uh, security of the hash function and on the secret key, of course. So the idea is that we include the prefix 
as one of the parameters of the hash function so that if the prefix changes, for example, when we move from one network to another, of course the result of f is going to change. We also include an interface index, index which means that every essentially the interface index is a small number that identifies different inter network interface cards on the same system. The idea is essentially that we have, if we have, for example, a computer with, let's say, three different NICs, and uh, we are connecting to the same network with all the NICs at the same time, we want each interface to get a different address. If not, if this one wasn't here, then each interface would get the same address and we don't want that. Uh, network ID is optional and could be, for example, the SSID. That's optional, not really needed. And the secret key, our idea is that this one will be selected uh, during installation time, okay? And once you install the system, you keep, you keep that value constant. So uh, the idea with this scheme is that, for example, if uh, we connect to some specific network, the, um, let's say that we forget for a second about the interface ID, we are going to have some specific prefix, so the result of f is going to be some value. Then if we move from that network to another one, of course the prefix is going to change, and then the result of f is also going to change. So we get a different interface ID. Now let's say that we move back to the first network, to the network in which we were before. Now the values are going to be the same as in the previous case, so we get again the same address. So what we want are addresses that within a specific network, they are stable, they are not predictable because they are random, but they are stable, they don't change. So whenever we connect to the same network, we always get, we always get the same address that has been randomized, but when we move from one network to another, we want the interface ID to change. So that it's not always the, in, the same interface ID that's going to be used in, in every network. Um, so this essentially uh, has the, the benefits of all the schemes that we had so far. So uh, by using this scheme, we can uh, mitigate the host scanning problem because the interface ID is essentially randomized. So the search space is going to be 64 bits. There's no pattern that these services will follow. Of course, assuming that the guy implementing this uh, selects a, a cryptographically secure a hash function, for example, and of course that the secret key is not known, right? And also, um, we will also mitigate the privacy issue because as the same system moves from one network to another, the interface ID changes. So it's not possible to identify the same node uh, because of any value or any bits on, on the on the uh, on the IPv6 address. As I said before, this uh, proposal was accepted by the six-man working group of the IETF. And I personally expect the, the document to be published as an RFC this, this year. The only, let's say, the, the only thing that could have been better is that I was expecting this scheme to essentially replace the existing ex uh, scheme of, uh, of producing addresses with the MAC address, but uh, essentially they wanted to produce st some standard that did this, but not to replace the, the old standard politics, okay? <laughs> Uh, another topic is that of uh, IPv6 fragmentation and reassembly. Uh, in v6, fragmentation is done with extension header, which means that you don't have fragmentation bits in the in the or fragmentation field in the fixed IPv6 header. You, if you want to fragment a packet, you essentially have to include a fragmentation header, which contains all the fragmentation-related fields that we have in the fixed IPv4 header. Among the, the uh, among the those those fields are the identification value, which essentially is used to identify fragments of the same packet, and uh, what else? The more fragment bits that essentially tells you whether this one is the last fragment or not. So, what are the uh, security implications of fragmentation and reassembly and so on? Well, they are essentially all the same ones as in the IPv4 world. So, for example, if you use uh, predictable fragment IDs, uh, you are going to be subject, or you may be leveraged for evil scanning, denial of service attacks, and, and so on. Uh, and probably one thing that uh, may exacerbate this problem is that as a result of the larger addresses, and also, for example, uh, the increased size of packets, for example, resulting from DNSSEC, uh, it may, uh, it's likely that uh, the amount of fragmented traffic will, will increase. So we might expect uh, 
one of the things that before actually looking at this I was expecting was to see that all implementations did the right thing because it was a problem that was here for the IP before war, okay? So um, what we did was we produced a tool to um, assess the, the fragment ID generation policy of different systems. So this is ju just some of them, some of the ones that we tested. So you can see, for example, that in the case of, let's say, all the BSD ones, the, um, the fragment ID is randomized, but you have other systems that uh, use predictable values. For example, Solaris, Windows, and, and Linux, they, they, they used to use different predictable schemes. For example, in the case of previous versions of Linux, essentially when the system was, was bootstrapped, they uh, initialized a global counter to zero, and then for each fragmented packet, they would increase the fragment ID by one. That's essentially the same problem that we had with IPv4 like more than 10 years ago. Um, here you can see the um, uh, well, changes between the, the, this version of Linux and the current version. Well, this was current uh, last year. Uh, and this was the result of them patching the, the, the operating system when we uh, reported the problem to them. Uh, Solaris patched this one, so I don't really know what's supposed to be, well, let's say Solaris current or whatever it is. They also patched this one. And uh, for Windows, I think they are still using the same, the same uh, scheme. So if you try, and actually uh, there are tools that you can use to uh, automatically assess the, the fragment ID policy. Uh, you could, uh, for example, assess a Windows implementation and see that they are using predictable values. Uh, probably what was nice about working on this is that at least when it comes to um, open source projects, they were, uh, they, they, uh, they reacted in a very timely fashion in terms of a few weeks. So that was nice. That was the case of Linux and Solaris too. In the case of Windows, I essentially, I must have exchanged like maybe 10 emails with uh, Secure or Security and Microsoft, whatever. And at some point I got tired of that and I forgot about it. Uh, a friend of mine argues that there is, well, I don't, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> um, so, um, of course, the, the obvious way to fix this uh, predictable uh, fragment ID thing is to select the fragment IDs uh, with some scheme that doesn't produce predictable values. Uh, you might argue that, or of course, that's like easy because I could just randomize the, the fragment ID, but the problem is that if you uh, actually do that, that may lead to fragment ID collisions, which essentially means that you're re reusing the same fragment ID value like too soon or too quickly, and that might mean that uh, your fragments get discarded. So we have this document that we wrote with different schemes on, on how to select the fragment ID, and there are a number of choices. Some of them are more secure than the others, but then the, the more randomized the scheme is, the more likely, in many cases, it is that you will have uh, fragment ID collisions. Uh, I was expecting the working group that I mentioned before, six months, to adopt this document a uh, couple of months ago. That has not yet happened. Might happen, I don't know. Um, another topic related with fragmentation is that of um, reassembly. Uh, you probably all know from the IPv4 world that if you have, for example, overlapping fragments in the IPv4 world, those can be leveraged for uh, evading network intrusion detection systems. That was published and discussed to death like more than 10 years ago. So we have in IPv6 exactly the same problem. The specifications allow for overlapping fragments. And um, probably the only difference is that in the case of IPv4, at least in theory, uh, there, are my, there could be some scenarios in which you could have legitimate overlapping fragments. But in the IPv6 case, it's not really the case. It's impossible to have legitimate overlapping fragments because fragmentation is only done at the, uh, at the host, not on the, on the network itself. So um, a couple of years ago, I think, this RFC uh, 5722 was published. And essentially what they do is forbid the use of overlapping fragments which means that if you receive overlapping fragments, you should drop them. Um, I don't know if I have a slide with a, with a list, oh no, with the support of, uh, of, well, of the implementation of this RFC in different implementations. 
But uh, the idea is that most current operating systems already implement RFC 5722, which is, of course, an improvement over IPv4. In the blog, this URL, you have um, an assessment that we did of many different implementations as to whether, for example, uh, they, uh, they drop overlapping fragments or they use the first copy of the data, the second copy of the data, and, and so on. Uh, another interesting case in, with B6 fragmentation that is not actually present in IPv4 is that you can have what we ended up calling atomic fragments uh, essentially, if you receive an ICMP version 6 packet to big message that claims an MTU smaller than 1280, uh, le and let's say that you needed to send this packet to some system on the network, then the, standards, the standard tells you that you need to include a fragment header in between the fixed IPv6 header and the rest of the payload. So the reason for which we call these packets atomic fragments is because in theory, they are fragmented, but they are composed of a single fragment. So in, even, when they, even when they contain a fragment header, a, a fragment header they are not actually fragmented. Um, a problem that we found with the way uh, many different implementations were handling these atomic fragments is that rather than, as, rather than saying, OK, I, I got this packet, but it's composed of a single fragment, so I don't really need to wait for other packets to reassemble it, they were mixing the atomic fragment with existing fragmented traffic. So rather than just taking this packet and say, okay, I will strip the fragment header because it's just a packet composed of a single fragment, they were mixing the atomic fragment with existing fragments. And uh, of course, that was undesirable. Uh, okay, so I thought I had a slide for this, but um, uh, we reported this to different operating systems. And essentially, if you look at uh, current versions of popular operating systems, they have all implemented this, uh, let's say, improved processing, which means that now if they receive one of these packets, they realize that it's a fragment that is composed of a single fragment, so that they don't need to mix this atomic fragment with any other fragmented traffic that they have already in the, in the, in the fragment queue. Um, this is the document that we uh, submitted to the ITF. This one was adopted, I think, that last December, last year, uh, and it's like in almost like the last stage of, uh, in the IETF process. So this one should be published in, uh, in a few months as an RFC. Ah, there was the slide. So this is the this is the assessment that we did for the um, for different implementations. So you can see, for example, uh, whether, they, uh, whether they implement the improved processing or not. The improved processing, of course, means that, for example, in the case of, let's say, all these versions of FreeBSD, if they receive an atomic fragment and they also have fragmented traffic for this, for, with this, using the same fragment ID, they will try to put all the fragments together, even when the atomic fragment doesn't need to be reassembled with anything. Uh, if you look at other implementations, let's say, for example, Linux, uh, Solaris, and uh, OpenBSD current, they implemented this uh, improved processing. So when they handle atomic fragments, uh, they don't mix those packets with uh, existing, existing fragmented traffic. Again, uh, a nice thing about working on this was that um, uh, different operating systems reacted very quickly. So for example, OpenBSD, I think they patched this in terms of a couple of weeks, which was, of course, nice. A uh, couple of comments about IPv6 first hop security. First hop security, I think, is a term that I borrowed for, from Cisco. They call first hop security like every policy that you can enforce on a, on a local network. Uh, and for example, things that you could call um, first hop security is uh, monitoring uh, neighbor discovery traffic in the same way that we used to do our watch in IPv4. Other things that you could do, for example, is what is called DHCP snooping. DHCP snooping is something that you can do on, on B4, which means that, for example, you may have a switch, and let's say that you have eight different ports, and you can tell the device, okay, I only want the DHCP server packets to be allowed on this particular port. So if you receive a DHCP server packet on any of the other ports, drop it, okay? That's, let's say, like a cheap way, if you want, to protect against some of those attacks, but that's still effective. So the idea was to evaluate whether it was possible to actually implement the same kinds of techniques, but on IPv6. 
So what's the main problem with V6? Well, the problem is that, for example, when it comes to uh, neighbor discovery traffic, that is the, the replacement to uh, ARP in, in the case of IPv6, uh, neighbor discovery is implemented on, on top of IPv6, which means that since it's uh, implemented on top of IPv6, you can have extension headers, you can have fragmentation, and so on. For example, if I was an attacker I, and I wanted to perform some kind of attack based on router advertisement messages, I could produce this packet, okay, which contains destination option header, to destination option header, and then the, the actual uh, router advertisement. And actually before sending that packet, what I could do is just fragment the first one. Now if you take a look here, what I did is that I split this original packet into two pieces, but um, in the first piece, you only have part of one of the extension headers, and then you have the rest of the extension header chain on the second fragment. The problem with this is that if you have a layer 2 device trying to, uh, for example, inspect this traffic, it's impossible. Because if you just look at this packet, you cannot tell what's inside that packet. And if you look at the second fragment, it's also impossible to tell what's inside. So you either have, you essentially have to.